Haussmann's renovation of Paris was a vast public works program commissioned by Emperor Napoleon III and directed by his prefect of the Seine, Georges Eugène Haussmann, between 1853 and 1870. It included the demolition of crowded and unhealthy medieval neighborhoods, the building of wide avenues, parks and squares, the annexation of the suburbs surrounding Paris, and the construction of new sewers, fountains and aqueducts. Haussmann's work met with fierce opposition, and he was finally dismissed by Napoleon III in 1870, but work on his projects continued until 1927. The street plan and distinctive appearance of the center of Paris today is largely the result of Haussmann's renovation. In the middle of the 19th century, the center of Paris was overcrowded, dark, dangerous, and unhealthy. In 1845, the French social reformer Victor Considerant wrote Paris is an immense workshop of putrefaction, where misery, pestilence, and sickness work in concert, where sunlight and air rarely penetrate. Paris is a terrible place where plants shrivel and perish, and where, of seven small infants, four die during the course of the year. The street plan on the Taille de la Site and in the neighborhood called the Quartier des Arcus, between the Louvre and the Hotel de Ville City Hall, had changed little since the Middle Ages. The population density in these neighborhoods was extremely high, compared with the rest of Paris in the neighborhood of the Champs, Iesis, there was one resident for every 186 square meters in the neighborhoods of Arc is and saint avoy In the present third arrondissement, there was one inhabitant for every three square meters. In 1840, a doctor described one building in the Taille de la Site where a single room 5 meters squares on the fourth floor was occupied by 23 people, both adults and children. In these conditions, disease spread very quickly. Cholera epidemics ravaged the city in 1832 and 1848. In the epidemic of 1848, 5% of the inhabitants of these two neighborhoods died. Traffic circulation was another major problem. The widest streets in these two neighborhoods were only 5 meters wide the narrowest were only 1 or 2 meters wide. Wagons, carriages and carts could barely move through the streets. The center of the city was also a cradle of discontent and revolution between 1830 and 1848. Seven armed uprisings and revolts had broken out in the center of Paris, particularly along the Faubourg Saint Antoine, around the Hotel de Ville, and around Montaigne Saint Genevieve on the left bank. The residents of these neighborhoods had taken up paving stones and blocked the narrow streets with barricades, and had to be dislodged by the army. Let's take a look at this video of these little kids they were offered the option of having one marshmallow immediately now or two marshmallows 15 minutes later and you've got some very cute videotape of this experiment. So let's take a look okay, what we found is a very simple and direct way of measuring a competence that seems to make an important life difference a researcher tells these preschoolers that she's going to leave the room if they wait for her to come back without eating the marshmallows. They'll get two marshmallows or they can ring the bell and she'll come back right away but then they only get one marshmallow. I would baby though you won't ring the bell, okay, looking at children over time. Dr. Michelle has found that being able to wait longer at four has some pretty powerful implications and what are those powerful implications is that that later in life. The more discipline and have more self-control is that pretty much it. Well, they are more likely to achieve their life goals. They have better relationships. They did better on their SI is crazy all because they waited 15 minutes for don't wash me, and I think it is crazy. I probably would have eaten all three but yeah me too.
But um you know actually yes, the ability to be able to pursue your goals in this case it was stabbed two marshmallows versus one and not going automatic and just grab the marshmallow is a very important skill, but I think a main point in mind in the making is that these skills can be caught, taught if you re 14 or 40 or or 4 it's not ever too late and any child can learn the many adult can teach them and it's never too late. This is the first ocean deployment of two new high-precision instruments designed to monitor the Earth's signals from the seafloor. This housing contains the tilt meter and nano-bottom pressure recorder and the associated electronics and cabling used for power and communications. The instruments were deployed on the seafloor by a remotely operated vehicle as part of the Mars seafloor. Observatory test bed located at a depth of 3,000 feet in Monterey Bay in this first test deployment in the ocean, it have already detected the ground motion from several large earthquakes as far from the Mars site as Chile and the Mariana Trench in the future. The instruments will be part of a global network of cabled seafloor observatories. Because of their precision these two new instruments are already detecting signals, which could never be measured before. A wind turbine is a device that will convert wind into mechanical movement, which we can use to power water pump or electricity generator. Now the power that a turbine creates is obviously dependent on the wind speed, but it's also dependent obviously on the number of sails, the area of the sails, and the angle that the sails makes to the wind. So if you can imagine if the turbine blades are flat onto the wind, the wind is just going to sort of bend it. But if they're at a slight angle, when the wind hits it, it's going to turn the blades and we can use that for powering things. Now we're going to have a go at making some very, very simple paper windmills, the sort of things that you can make from the bits and pieces lying around at home and use that to drive a very small generator to power electronic devices. And this illustration often used is the one of the monkeys at the typewriter. 
Okay, so we have a monkey sitting at a typewriter, and the claim here is, basically, if you leave chance and time long enough, you will get life, don't worry about it. Yes, it's strange, yes, it's wonderful, but leave enough matter 600 million years on Earth, and you will have life. So the monkey's sitting at the typewriter, and the chances are, eventually, he produces the complete works of Shakespeare, so what's the problem? But he doesn't manage to do it in 600 million years. So what I decided to do to run the numbers is I, instead of saying type the complete works of Shakespeare, I just ran the numbers for how long would it take a monkey typing at one keystroke a second to type to be or not to be, that is the question. Right? On average, how long is it going to take my monkey friend at one keystroke a second? I don't know how long you think that would be. Maybe you could have a guess. Would it be less or more than 600 million years, which is the period life on Earth is in, supposed to have emerged within? And when I ran the numbers, to be or not to be, that is the question, takes 12.6 trillion, 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 trillion years to type just that phrase. And a DNA string, that complexity emerged by chance, undirected, within 600 million years. Again, it's mathematically possible, but it's so incredibly unlikely that it would have that it tilts me in favour of the Christian story in which God creating life is simply a question of saying, let there be, and there was. For better or worse, we live in a world profoundly affected by Sigmund Freud. If I had to ask you, choose a psych you know, name a famous psychologist, the answer most of you would be Freud. Um, he's the most famous psychologist ever, and he's had a profound influence on the 20th and 21st century. Um, some biographical information, he was born in the 1850s. He spent most of his life in um, Vienna, Austria. And, um, but he died in London, and he escaped to London soon after retreating there um, at the beginning of World War II, as the Nazis began to occupy where he lived. He's one of the most famous scholars ever, but he's not known for any single discovery. Instead, he's known for the development of an encompassing theory of mind, um, one that he developed over um, the span of many decades. He was, in his time, extremely well-known a celebrity recognized on the street. And throughout his life, he was a man of extraordinary energy and productivity, um, in part because he was a very serious cocaine addict, but also just in general, he was just a high energy sort of person. The skoog is a new university accessible musical instrument. It is designed to use by children or adults with special needs or in fact be used by anyone. It's soft, it's easy to play, it's robust and it can be customized to suit anyone's abilities.
The SCOOG helps students with special needs by allowing them to get involved in making music themselves. It's an instrument that they can play at and they can take ownership of and start creating their own sounds and music. Traditional instruments are the shape and size and made of the materials they are because of the sound that they need to make. If you want to make a sound like a plucked string, you need a string and it needs to be under tension, whereas with a SCOOG, because it's a mixture of software and a sensor, then thus the computer can handle making the sound. And so we can design an object that's designed to be touched and designed to be played with. In developing the screen and working with kids in the schools and in the classrooms, it's really helped us make the SCOOG something that's usable by the children themselves. They've informed us massively on how it needs to work and they've given their opinions on colors and designs. And just the feedback they've given to us has been just marvelous. It's just so enriching and it's really inspiring to actually work with these kids, particularly when you can provide them with an ability to start to playing their own music as opposed to just taking part through listening and listening to other musicians and really learning from. Subscribe our channel to get weekly and monthly PTA exam predictions, according to your exam date. Please like, comment and share this video. Your appreciation is biggest motivation for us. See you in next video.